To me, one of the most fascinating things about linear systems is just how many different tools we have to design and analyze them. And among the most popular are probably the Nyquist, Bode, Nichols, and root locus diagrams. And what makes these tools powerful is that they let us understand certain aspects of the closed loop system by analyzing the open loop behavior. Nyquist, Bode, and Nichols diagrams focus on how the open loop system responds across frequencies, specifically its gain and phase shift. And I've linked to a tech talk that dives deeper into those if you are interested. Now, root locus, on the other hand, takes a different approach. It looks at the locations of poles and zeros in the open loop system and shows how the closed loop poles move as you change the loop gain. Now, I'll be honest, I've never actually used a root locus directly for designing controllers in industry, but I do think it's still worth learning because it builds intuition about linear systems. And that intuition can make you a better control engineer, even if you never use a root locus diagram specifically. So in this video, I wanna show you some intuition that you can get by thinking in terms of the root locus. I think it'll be pretty interesting, so I hope you stick around for it. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. To begin, let's go over briefly what the root locus diagram is showing us. Let's say that we have a model of our open loop plant in the form of a transfer function. And this model has two zeros, both of which are on the negative real line, and two poles, which are a complex conjugate pair. These are the open loop poles and zeros of the system. And with a root locus diagram, we can understand how these change as we close the loop around this system. So what I mean by this is that let's say that we feed back the output of the system, then compare it to a reference, and then multiply this error by a gain. The question is, how does this impact the location of the poles and zeros? Well, we can calculate that. Our open loop system is the gain times the plant, and then the closed loop transfer function from R to Y is kg of S divided by one plus kg of S. And if we think of kg S as a numerator and a denominator, we can plug this in and then simplify the equation to get this. Here, notice that the closed loop transfer function has the same numerator as the open loop transfer function, which means that it's going to have the same zeros. They haven't moved by closing the loop. However, the denominator has changed, so we should expect the poles to move to new locations. And if I plot the closed loop poles and zeros on the same diagram, you can see the zeros are in the same spot and the poles have moved. In fact, the locations of the poles change based on the gain k. And if I adjust the gain a little bit, you can see that the closed loop poles, in fact, start to move. But they aren't moving randomly. If I sweep from a really low gain to a really high gain, you can sort of see that the poles move along certain lines. They start near the open loop poles, and then they make their way towards the open loop zeros. The lines that these poles trace are the root locus. They are the paths that the closed loop roots take as you adjust the gain. And the reason that they go from the open loop poles to the open loop zeros is pretty easy to understand. If we just look at the denominator in our closed loop transfer function, the closed loop poles are a combination of both the open loop poles and the open loop zeros. And when K is really small, the open loop poles dominate. And then when k is really large, the open loop zeros dominate. And when k is somewhere in between, there is a combination of the two following the lines in the root locus diagram. So why is this helpful? Well, for one, the location of the closed loop poles determine the stability of the system. And we can, to some extent, also understand the system's response to an input. And I'll get to that later. But the second benefit of root locus is that we can approximate the diagram with just a handful of rules. And I've covered them a long time ago in a series of videos that I'll link to below if you wanna learn more about that. But by understanding the drawing rules and therefore how the diagram will change when you add additional poles and zeros, you have a bit of intuition into how different controllers are going to affect the closed loop poles and the stability of your system. So let's jump over to MATLAB and I'll show you a quick example of this. Here, I've already defined the open loop system G, which is just a simple second order system with no zeros. And now we can design a controller around this system 
with the Control System Designer app. Okay, so up here on top, we have the root locus. And then on the bottom is the closed loop step response. In the root locus, the blue X's are the open loop poles, and the purple squares are the closed loop pole locations given a specific gain. So now I can grab a purple square and move it around to change the gain of the system, and thereby changing the location of the closed loop poles. However, if you look at the step response for this system, it overshoots a bit and then it oscillates before finally settling down. And this is gonna be true regardless of which gain I choose. And this is because the two poles are off of the real axis. And we can see from the root locus that there is no amount of gain that's gonna fix that. So with proportional only feedback with this particular system, the response is always going to oscillate. So we need to update the controller to get the response that we're looking for. And this is where understanding the drawing rules can be helpful because then it's not just trial and error of popping zeros and poles around and hoping, but we can do it with a little bit of knowledge. And since I didn't go over the drawing rules in this video, I'm not gonna to rely too heavily on them. Instead, we can use what we already know, which is that the closed loop poles eventually end at an open loop zero. So by putting a zero on the real line in the left half plane, we know that we're going to encourage those poles to move left to be more stable and to move down to the real line where we put that zero. And now we can adjust the gain to put the poles right where we want. All right, so that's already pretty powerful, right? But zeros are doing more than just attracting the closed loop poles. They are also impacting the system response. And to see what I mean, let me delete the zero and go back to the original system. The only thing to pay attention to here is that the closed loop poles are pretty close to the open loop poles. And the response looks like this, right? It starts at zero, and then it shoots up to about 0.45 before finally settling around 0.35. Now, let me add a pair of zeros into our system. And check this out. The closed loop poles are still really close to the open loop poles, so nothing has changed there. The stability of the system is exactly the same. But the response is wildly different. Now it's almost a flat line right at 0.35. So what happened? Well, the zeros changed the response. And I think it's worthwhile talking about why that is. Let's look at an open loop system with just a single pole at s equals minus one. So the transfer function for this system is one over s plus one. And also notice here that we're just looking at a pole zero plot in the complex plane. We're not looking at a root locus here. So that means that we're not gonna look at how this pole is gonna move when we close the loop. We just wanna investigate how pole and zero locations affect the response of the system. All right, so we can see here that the pole is in the left half plane, which means that the step response is stable and it gradually reaches one over time with no overshoot. And I'm showing the response of the entire system with this white line and then the response just from this single pole with the dashed blue line. But, you know, since there's only this one pole, they line up perfectly on top of each other. Now let's add a second pole on the real axis at s equals minus six. Now we have a second order system and we can look at the response of the entire system like we see here with this white line. However, this response is actually the summation of the two individual poles. And we can calculate their individual contributions using partial fraction expansion. The transfer function denominator can be split up into the product of the two poles, and then each pole could be the denominator of their own fraction with an unknown value in the numerator. We can then calculate these values to be minus 1.2 and 1.2 for A and B respectively. These values are called the residue. And the way that we can think about them is that they give us the relative contribution of each individual pole. So if we go back over to this plot, you can see how much the pole at minus six contributes to the total response and how much the pole at minus one is contributing. And you can see that the pole at minus one contributes the majority of the response. And we refer to this as the dominant pole. So in this case, 
our second order system is going to mostly behave like a first order system with a single pole at minus one. And as we move these poles around, we can see that the residue changes, or the individual contributions from each pole is changing. And this is an important concept because now we can see how a zero affects the system. I'll add a zero here and check this out. We can see that the zero changes the residue. It's kind of interesting that all we're really doing with a zero is adjusting the amount that each pole contributes to the system's response. And this is one reason why zeros don't affect stability. They aren't changing the underlying shape of the components that make up the response, they're just changing the relative amounts of each. So this means that we can use a zero to affect the response of the system by using it to change the contribution from each of the poles. For example, if I move the zero closer to the left pole, that pole contribution to the total response is reduced. And the closer the zero is to the pole, the less impact the pole has. And if I could somehow place the zero directly on the pole, then it is canceled out and the response is completely from the pole at minus one. And the opposite is true. If we move the zero closer to the dominant pole, it's no longer dominant. And the system now behaves like it only has a pole at minus six. So hopefully you can see that the zeros and poles work together to change the response of the system. But how can we use this information for controller design, say by designing a PID controller? Well, let's look at a second order system that has no zeros and look at the root locus for it. We have these two open loop poles and with this particular closed loop gain, we get these two closed loop poles in pink. Again, we don't have much control with a proportional only controller. And so no matter what gain we choose, this system will always oscillate since we can only have these two complex poles. Now, if we add in the derivative term, this adds a zero on the real axis and pulls those closed loop poles left and down, just like we saw before. And we can move this zero around by changing the proportional and derivative gains. And this, you know, might be all we need to get the response that we're looking for. But if we also add in the integrator term, this adds a pole at the origin and a second zero. And by adjusting the PID gains, we can place these two zeros wherever we like. And now we have the flexibility to do something cool. We know we can reduce the effect of the closed loop poles by placing zeros near them. And so if I don't want the system to oscillate, I can place the two zeros near the two open loop poles. Now, we might not be able to place these zeros exactly on top of the poles, but that's not an issue because all we're really trying to do is just reduce their effect, not cancel them out completely. And you can see that by reducing their effect, the third pole, which is on the real axis, is contributing almost all of the total response for the system. So in this way, we can use PID control to get a second order system to behave like its first order. And we were able to get a little intuitive understanding of why this works by looking at the root locus. So I think it's kind of interesting that even though you might not look at a root locus diagram going forward, there's still a lot of interesting ideas about linear systems that we can glean from them. And one way I think you can build up that intuition is to just open up a system in the Control System Designer app and play around with adding poles and zeros and see how that affects the system stability and response. All right, so that's where I'm going to leave this video. Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you enjoyed this explanation, you can find all of the Tech Talk videos across many different topics nicely organized at mathworks.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.